Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about windowing. The prerequisites for this material are Fourier series and discrete Fourier transform. So here we have a speech signal and in order to analyze it, something that, what we, might, that we might want to do is determine how the frequency components in the signal change over time. So it turns out that in this signal, actually, someone is saying no, 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 and then yes, 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 uh, in Hebrew. And um, in order to analyze um, the signal, it might be useful to know what frequency components are mostly present when the person, for example, says no, or when the person says yes. If we just apply the Fourier series um, if we just compute the Fourier series coefficients from the signal, we get a plot like this where we can see which frequencies are higher. So we can identify frequencies, you know, like um, oscillating components at certain frequencies in the signal. So we know that there are components that oscillate at this frequency, at this frequency, uh, here, here. So um, we know what frequencies are present in the signal, but we don't know when they are active. We don't know if they're active here or here or here. So in order to determine how the frequency information changes over time, a reasonable approach is to uh, segment the signal or cut it up by multiplying with window functions. We'll see what we mean in a moment and then compute the Fourier series. And that's going to be the topic of this lecture. Okay, so imagine that you have a very simple signal like this, much simpler than the speech signal that we just saw, and you're only interested in the frequency components within a certain window. Okay, and later on, what essentially what we're going to do is what we're going to do is over um, consecutive windows, just to try to figure out what's going on in each of those intervals. That is what the short time Fourier transform it consists of. We'll see this in the, in the next video. But for now, let's restrict ourselves to the case where we're just interested in um, one particular interval and we apply a window function to um, essentially eliminate the parts of the signal that are not within that interval. So here we would multiply with this window function and boom. Okay, we have restricted our signal of interest to that particular interval. And now we would compute the uh, Fourier coefficients of this windowed signal. Okay, so we're going to focus on the case where our signal of interest is a sinusoid. And now our question is, what happens if we multiply a complex sinusoid with frequency k prime? What happens if we multiply it by some arbitrary function, which is our window function? Okay. How do, um, how do the Fourier coefficients, in this case, the DFT coefficients, because we're considering discrete functions, but something very similar holds for continuous functions. How do these Fourier coefficients look like? So then let's take a look. We're computing, remember, the Fourier coefficients, the DFT coefficients of this signal, okay? X times uh, the complex sinusoid. So the way we do it is we compute the inner product with a uh, complex sinusoids of different frequencies. So just so we don't get confused, k prime is the frequency of the complex sinusoid that we're multiplying this signal with. And now we're interested in the kth Fourier coefficient of um, this product between them, this pointwise multiplication. Okay, so now we're going to expand this complex sinusoid into what it actually looks like. And now we see that we have a product of two exponentials, so we can put that together as the exponential of the product. And now this expression exactly corresponds to the inner product between x and a complex sinusoid with frequency, with a modified frequency, k minus k prime. So the Fourier coefficient, the kth Fourier coefficient of this pointwise multiplication is exactly the same as the k minus k prime 
Fourier coefficient of this window function. So as a cartoon illustration, if your window function has a Fourier, has the FT coefficient that looks something like that, well, then the windowed function, so y, is going to have Fourier coefficients. I, I can actually draw this straight. It's a bit shameful. It's much better, much prettier. Um, it's going to have Fourier coefficients that are shifted by k prime. Okay, so usually we're not interested in what happens with um, complex sinusoids. We're more interested in what happens with real sinusoids. I mean, we are interested in what happens with complex sinusoids. It's just that often our signals of interest are real. So let's take a look at what happens with a real sinusoid. In this case, with a phase that is equal to zero, but the, the same argument it would go through if, if it had like some shift here. So if, it, if here there was plus some kind of phase, that's not too important. Okay, and again, this is a, a real sinusoid that has frequency k prime. Okay, so we have this real sinusoid. Now, um, this is the DFT of the sinusoid. Note that uh, there's two non-zero uh, Fourier coefficients because real sinusoids are equal to complex a complex sinusoid with the same frequency plus a complex sinusoid with minus that frequency. Remember that. And now we multiply with this window, so we see this windowed signal. And now the question is, does the DFT of this original, uh, sorry, of this windowed signal resemble the DFT of the original signal? Okay, that's what we want to find out. So what uh, happens if we window a real sinusoid? We're interested in, so we're calling this real sinusoid S, we're interested in the DFT of x times s. Uh, remember that you can write the real sinusoid as a sum of two complex sinusoids. And now um, the result is going to follow from our previous result because the DFT, when we're applying, where we're computing the DFT of something, that's a linear transformation because it's just like applying a matrix. So the DFT of the DFT of x psi k prime over 2 plus s psi of minus k prime over 2. That's just going to be the DFT of this guy divided by 2 plus the DFT of this guy divided by 2, just by linearity of the DFT. And now and we know that the DFT of this guy is the same as the DFT of x shifted by k prime. The DFT of this guy is the DFT of x shifted by uh, minus k prime. So that's essentially what we have here. Okay, this, is, this just follows from linearity. And now um, we're going to have these two shifts of the DFT of x summed up together or average because we have this one over two. That's going to be the DFT of uh, the windowed sinusoid. So realize that in order to know how this looks like, we need to know how the DFT of the window looks like. Okay, we need to compute the DFT of the window. We're going to do that for the rectangular window, uh, which is just defined as being equal to 1 uh, between minus w and w and 0 otherwise. So um, this now we're just going to, going to compute those DFT coefficients. We just essentially apply the formula to the zeroth DFT coefficient. Um, it's just equal to the average of the entries because here we would put an exponential with frequency zero, but that's just equal to one. When we add up all the entries, it has two w plus one entries, this rectangular window. Now for the DFT coefficient, um, the kth DFT coefficient, as usual, we compute the inner product between the window and a complex sinusoid with that frequency. Um, this, like the, the rectangular window is just zero out of like out of this uh, segment of length 2w plus 1 so basically this changes the sum to be from minus w to w and this remains and now this is just a geometric series from minus w to w so this is just going to be equal to r minus w 
minus r w plus 1 divided by 1 minus r. Okay, just a geometric series where r is equal to this. So plugging that in, this is the expression we get, and now we, we do some algebraic manipulations. In particular, it's useful um, to, to basically divide and multiply by this, and then you will see that the remaining, the, the remaining expression simplifies to these two sine functions. This is using this trick where you do like the exponential of something minus the exponential of minus something and that cancels out to be um, i times times a sine function and then this just simplifies so the mathematical manipulations are not too important although i encourage you to try to reproduce them on your own but the point is that we end up with a function that has this form this is called a sink and is a function of enormous importance in signal processing um, it looks like this so it has one main, main lobe and then it has several smaller lobes this is again the dft of the rectangular window so when we window the real sinusoid we're going to take we're going to obtain two shifts of that dft at minus at k prime k prime and minus k prime okay that's what we're going to obtain so the dft of the signal of the uh, of the cosine looks like this when we, when we uh, apply the window, what happens in the frequency domain is that we get these two shifts of the DFT of the window. So now I would like you to stop for a minute here, pause the video and think whether this is good or not. Like, are you happy with this? Because from here you can know where, what, what the frequency of that sinusoid is. So from that point of view, you might be happy that uh, this will allow you to find the frequency of the sinus. So think about it for a moment. The answer is that in general, we're not going to only have one sinusoidal component. You will have several sinusoidal components and also you might have some noise in the signal. And in that case, this, um, this is actually kind of problematic because now when I see this, especially if there's noise, it's unclear whether this comes from the side lobe of the sync function, which is the case in this case, or if there's another sinusoidal component at that frequency. Okay, all of this, this like tail, is actually really annoying because it resembles smaller frequency components that could be there. We just don't know. So this is not great. We don't like this very much. Uh, something to note is like, well, you might be wondering, so why, why on earth do we see these fluctuations? Uh, where is this coming from? Well, the intuitive explanation for that is that a rectangular window, actually, when we look at it, if I find it, when you look at the rectangular window, wow, I, okay, when we look at the rectangular window here, there's this very, very sharp transition from one to zero. This actually is very non-sinusoidal somehow. Uh, so it requires, um, when you're building this using sinusoids, you need a lot of high um, frequency sinusoids in order to build this very sharp transition. And that's why when you look at the DFT, it has these um, high frequency components. Similarly, when we multiply the signal here, we have produced an artificial transition here, which is very, very sudden. This very sudden transition you want to reproduce it by summing a lot of sinusoids together because, I mean, that's essentially what we get when we do uh, the DFT, right? The DFT tells us the coefficients of sinusoids that when we add them together, they give us back this signal. Because of that sharp transition that we have introduced artificially in order to just um, compute the frequency information in that particular interval, because of that sharp transition, now we have these spurious high frequencies appearing in our DFT. Okay, that's where all of this stuff comes from, from the sharp transition of the rectangular window. And then when we compute the DFT of the windowed signal, that's where this is coming from, from that transition that is introduced by multiplying with the rectangular window. So that's not good. In order to avoid that, what we can do is we can multiply 
by a window that decreases smoothly to zero instead of having this sharp transition. The bad thing about that is that that is going to introduce some distortion in the time domain, as we will see in a moment. So this is the um, this is the expression for this window here that uh, you know just goes to zero very smoothly. Uh, this is the DFT of the window. So now you can see that in sharp contrast to the um, rectangular window, it does not have these high frequency components. It's much much it decays much faster to zero. So now when we take this signal and we window it using the hand window, there are many other alternatives that are similar to this, but the general idea is, is the same. We multiply it by a signal that uh, decays slowly to zero as opposed to having a sharp transition. When you do that, you produce some distortion in the time domain. So you can see that this does not look as much like the signal as it used to like when we multiply by the rectangular signal, but in exchange, you produce less distortion in the frequency domain. Okay, so now this is the original DFT of the signal, this is the DFT of the hand window, and this is the DFT of the windowed signal. So now it's very clear that we have a single component here and then there's nothing over here. Okay, we don't have, we have much less side lobes that could be misinterpreted by other, uh, to represent other um, frequency components. Okay, in contrast, if we were doing this with the windowed signal, we would have all these spurious side lobes where we don't know. We don't know if there are other frequency components or not. Notice that there is some uh, price to pay because this is here, this is going to be slightly, oops, slightly wider than this. So it's a bit less sharp, but at least it doesn't have all of these artifacts. So in practice, we always use uh, windows like this. Okay, so now if we worry about the time resolution that we are achieving, we can realize that the time resolution, so basically how sharply can we tell um, when the frequency components are changing, it, that's governed by the width of the window. When we cut up the signal, if we cut it into smaller intervals, we will, go, we will know with more precision how the frequencies are changing. So this would suggest maybe making the window arbitrarily narrow. Okay, but unfortunately, if we do that, then what's going to happen is that the window is going to expand in the frequency domain, and that's going to affect our frequency resolution. Because if you realize, I'm going to erase here, the frequency resolution that we achieve here depends on how wide this window is. If this window is very fat like that, then we don't know exactly, especially if there's noise and so on, we don't know exactly what frequency this. Um, sinusoid hat. If it's narrow, then we know that it was, you know, like basically it, it's more sharply localized. So how sharply you can localize frequencies when you're doing windowing depends on how wide the window is in the frequency domain. Uh, however, how sharply you localize things in time depends on the width in the time domain. If you, however, if like, and the problem here is that if you make the window very narrow in the time domain, it's going to expand in the frequency domain. So let's prove that first, and then we'll go back to its implications. So imagine that you have any window X or any signal for that matter X that is non-zero in a certain band of width to W around zero. And now here we're going to consider Fourier series because it's just easier to prove. Uh, when you're doing this in the discrete domain, you have to, when you're like uh, dilating a signal, it just gets a little bit hairy to go through the mathematical details, but the, the result is essentially the same. The point is that, uh, so, but we're going to restrict ourselves to, to, continuous, to the continuous case because it's, it's just easier to, to show the proof. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to consider x of alpha t. Notice here that um, alpha, um, if alpha is, for example, 2, we would have that y of t is equal to x of 2t. So if x is like this, then y of t um, is going to be, so at t equals 1, for example, a y has the same value as 
as x at t equals 2, right? So it's going to be a compressed version. So we're going to compress it like we're compressing in time, okay? If alpha is greater than 1. If alpha is smaller than 1, the opposite happens, you expand, okay? So now it turns out that, that the coefficients do the opposite. Here, the coefficients are k over alpha, which means that if the coefficients of x look like, let's say, something like that, then the coefficients of yt are going to expand to be doubled. Okay, this would be the coefficients of y, so the coefficients of x. So how do we prove that this happens, that when you compress in time, you dilate in frequency? Well, this just follows from uh, essentially a change of variables. So here we're computing the um, uh, Fourier coefficients of yt, which is um, um, uh, which is defined at x of alpha t, so this um, compressed version of x if, if alpha is, is greater than 2. So because, and then this is important, we have assumed that x is only non-zero between minus w and w, then x alpha t is non-zero between minus w over alpha and w over alpha. Okay, again, we're compressing, like if alpha is equal to 2, then x of alpha t is, is non-zero between minus w over 2 and w over 2. Okay, so now we do a change of variables and the alpha comes here. Okay, and that's why we have this factor of 1 over alpha over here. But this is exactly like computing the Fourier coefficients uh, for a frequency that is equal to k over alpha. Okay, so that uh, establishes the, the result because it's like an inner product with this frequency that has, uh, sorry, with this complex sinusoid that has frequency k over alpha. Just to show you a picture, imagine that we have this, um, this um, hand window uh, for w equals to 90. This is what it looks like in the time domain. This is what it looks like in the frequency domain. Now we compress in the time domain and boom, we lose frequency resolution as we gain time resolution. Okay, so you can't have your k connected to. If you want a lot of uh, time resolution, then you're not going to get a lot of frequency resolution. By the way, realize that this makes sense. So first of all, let's say that this actually has a, a very important name in the scientific, like in, in you know, like it's, it's a well-known a uh, result is called the uncertainty principle. You cannot resolve in time and frequency at the same time. And this is a fundamental trade-off. And I want you to think about it in, in these terms. Like if you have a sinusoid that is like this, in order to pinpoint its frequency exactly, you're going to have to observe it for quite a bit of time. If you cut, if you cut it here, you're going to be able to tell it's with only this information it's actually going to look quite similar to frequent to sinusoids that have similar frequencies. If you observe it over a longer time, you will be able to tell its frequency better. Okay, that's essentially what this uncertainty principle is saying. Um, when you're segmenting signals to try to determine the frequency information, if you segment with very tiny windows, it's going to be more difficult to distinguish the different sinusoidal components with different frequencies. Um, but you're going to take a lot of, get a lot of time resolution because it's, you will know exactly what is happening right here. If you start using bigger windows to make sure that you can distinguish well the different frequency components, then what's going to happen is that you lose time resolution, right? Because now you know what is happening in this interval, not within a smaller interval. Okay, so that's the, the fundamental trade-off. So what have we learned here? We have learned about the effect of temporal windowing when we segment functions uh, signals in order to um, determine how their frequency components change over time. And we also have learned that there's a fundamental trade-off where if you want to achieve a better time resolution, unfortunately, you're going to lose frequency resolution. Thank you very much.